Cal is our possession, carry on the business, borrow money, and then dispose of the assets. Let me just uh, talk briefly to the differentiation between a privately appointed receiver and a court appointed receiver. It's, um, it's something which has, has some differences in substance, um, a lot of differences when you get into a dispute. Primarily, a privately appointed receiver has a duty to his secured creditor who appoints him. Um, I think a good part of the, the bad reputation that receivers acquired in the last 20 years comes from taking that too seriously and failing to talk to other creditors and uh, generally alienating people. Um, hopefully that is now coming around and receivers will generally communicate with other creditors. Uh, the receiver do, private receiver does have a fiduciary duty to others, um, usually the, the debtor or a subsequent secure creditor where there is a surplus to be distributed. He has to account for that. Um, court appointed receiver is a different animal in that sense in that he's an officer of the court and has a, a duty then as a fiduciary to all interested parties. Um, the, the obligation of the court appointed receiver is to exercise reasonable care and control of the debtor's property as an ordinary man would give to his own property. And that's a slightly higher test um, but I think when it comes to dealing with assets, most receivers deal with it the same way. They apply the higher test anyway. As you can imagine, um, most security holders want to be in control of a situation when they've got a bad loan or uh, a bad account, and therefore they'd rather have a privately appointed receiver who reports to them than a, a court appointed receiver who's perhaps going to do something they don't like. I've, uh, next slide here. Set up a, uh, uh, Frank asked me to put together a checklist and unfortunately receiverships tend to be fairly free willing so I structured these slides in a sense as a bit of a checklist but uh, uh, not by any means a, a complete one. There are really the, the six phases in a receivership. Um, they're not independent and sequential but they are to, uh, to a large degree interwoven. The first one is the preparation. And by preparation, I mean everything you do prior to getting your appointment letter. Um, in the uh, 1970s, in the good old days of receivership, uh, you'd have a quiet week at the office, and then Friday along about noon, the bank would call and say, we've got a problem account. Would you mind coming out and doing something about it? You'd get to the bank at about 2, chat with the manager, you get in the car and drive out to the plant, and he'd hand over demand, and then he'd hand over the appointment letter, and away you went. Um, you then sort of ask the nice questions like, what's the name of the company, you know, and who are the people, and all these kinds of things. Um, that has very much gone with the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the Dunlop uh, decision, the, uh, the Lister, Lister and Dunlop, uh, Mr. Broadloo. Um, perhaps also, uh, not to give you in the legal profession, all the credit, I think the banks learned a very salutary lesson in the early 80s when they found that um, appointing a receiver didn't necessarily bring a very happy outcome for them. There, were, there was a point when they didn't appoint receivers at all because there was no one to buy the stuff anyway. And um, now the preparation phase is, is often the, the most challenging part of a problem situation where you're trying very desperately to, to get the situation early, identify the problems, and cure them rather than a point. There's a whole range of activities now in terms of monitoring and studies which are done which uh, were, not, uh, were not even considered. Possession, I think uh, I'll go into that in more depth, is the second phase. Going right alongside possession is the decision on preserving the business, following which you have to make up your mind how to realize, carry that out, and collect the money. Interwoven all the way through steps two, three, and four, and to some degree step one, is the vexing question of priorities. Um, it's, uh, it's become an absolute maze. We did a, uh, a brief to the Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs this year on the um, need to do away with deemed trust and statutory liens in bankruptcy proceedings. And uh, I think we came up with something like 35 or 40 statutes across Canada that create these things. 
very difficult to get your hands on what, what's there and who's first and who's second. And finally, I'll talk briefly about reporting, accounting, and fees, uh, topics which are fairly close to my heart, but probably uh, not much concern otherwise. In talking about the preparation, um, I've divided it into two parts. Uh, the first part I'll deal with is the business aspects, and then we'll talk about the, the legal aspects. Um, item one, the nature of the debt as problems. You have to recognize, I think, that receivership is a remedy of last resort and should always be a remedy of last resort. If you can identify problems early, get a good fix on what is, is the problem and can it be fixed, there is almost always a better way to deal with the problem. Receiverships generally occur either as a result of neglect by management and creditors in monitoring a situation and addressing it quickly, or as a result of egos, where you have somebody who's in a business and doesn't take advice from anyone. Um, those problems can be, can be very, very difficult to come to grips with. second uh, part of the preparation, which is, is very important, is, is to look at what the security interests are that are out there. Who's ahead of you? Or who has got security on other assets that may be related? Um, we had a receivership last year of a company which was a major manufacturer in its field. Tremendous goodwill in the marketplace. And we came in right at the beginning of the selling season. It was the receiver's dream. The only problem was that our lender only had the receivables and inventories as security, and the inventory we had wasn't assembled. Another secured creditor had the fixed assets. If we were to collect our receivables, if we were to dispose of our inventory, we had to convert it. We ended up playing, paying the full price to redeem the fixed assets, which we estimated at about 150% of market value, just to get at our security. Um, that was one of those decisions which I think caused a lot of sleepless nights in the bank. It's pretty hard to justify buying something for 150%. Fortunately, in the end, it worked out very well. Uh, the second example of, of problems with prior secured creditors is a situation right now where we have three secured creditors, one on fixed assets, one on operating assets, and one sitting behind both. Um, we unfortunately represent the one who's sitting behind both. And... Uh, when we looked at the situation for them, we said, you know, the, you, really your interest in this is to stop the other two from fighting. Your only hope to salvage your situation is to do that. They were gung-ho to put us in as receiver and run this thing, but if they had, um, the first secured credit on the operating assets would have collected the receivables we produced, and we would have been doling out money steadily, taking their place uh, to keep the business running. The third uh, thing to look at is the suitability of the powers. Um, General security agreements are pretty good these days, particularly where you're dealing with a sophisticated lender. But um, nobody wants to spend a lot of money in dealing with contingencies in a document, and so you tend to get boilerplate um, in the powers, which isn't considered in depth by the lender at the time of getting the document put on relative to the particular business. And uh, you can run into situations where you get an appointment without sufficient power to do it. Um, the worst one we had didn't come actually from a security document. It came from a court order where we were, uh, we were appointed as receiver and manager of a pirate ship. It was a replica of a 17th century pirate ship. And um, in their wisdom, the, uh, the people who wanted us to seize it went to court and got us the authority to borrow $10,000. We went out and we chased this thing, trying to beat it down the Trank Canal system. We finally caught up with it, only to discover that a, uh, a tank of gas for a pirate ship runs four grand, and that there was an unpaid insurance premium of 30. Um, he wasn't open for business, needless to say. There weren't any tourists around, and uh, we were stymied. I mean, we literally could not move the vessel. Uh, we could not do a thing until we got back to court and amended the powers. So there's a lot to be said for thinking very carefully about what the powers give you before you decide how you're going to do things. All of this really builds you up to whether you go for a private or a court appointment. 
um, inadequate powers, a clear reason to look at getting a court appointment to get something that, that lets you do what needs to be done. Uh, have you got a really contentious issue? Is there something you don't want to do privately? You'd rather have the blessing of the court before you do it. Uh, perhaps the commonest reason uh, these days for going to a court appointment is simply that uh, debtors seem to have come to the conclusion they have some rights in, in these matters, and uh, they tend to throw us out now. Um, our, our office record at this point is to be thrown out of one premises three times. Uh, we finally went back to the court order, and that got us back in. So, there are there are a number of reasons why you may choose to go to court appointment. Generally speaking, though, I think with a with a security holder, you you start off from the premise that we'd like to go private, unless there's a good reason not to. Another deterrent to going court appointment is it tends to be very costly. You've got appearances, you've got to go to court. Um, it means you 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 have a much heavier cost both on the receiver side and on the lawyer side. Last item I want to raise is, 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 is the new issue. Uh, I guess at the beginning of the 80s, the, uh, the preparation phase and the, uh, the debtor's rights issue became one. Um, the new issue these days is liability and regulatory responsibilities. Um, uh, my example for the, uh, the uh, liability item is, is I know of one receiver who was approached to become receiver of a gravel pit. Um, Fortunately, he decided to drive by the place before he accepted the appointment, and he noticed that it was unfenced. It was freely available to anybody, and it was full of water. He didn't know how deep, but it was full of water. So he went back to the lender and said, before you give me the appointment, let's see if we can insure ourselves on this thing. It took them three weeks to get insurance, um, at which point they took the appointment. But if they'd taken it right away and someone had decided to go swimming without realizing how deep it was, it could have been a very costly appointment. There's no question that uh, product liability itself has become an issue. Um, you know, uh, Cooper or whoever it is who makes the, the hockey helmets are pretty safe from receivership. I don't think anyone's going to want to go in and run that kind of a business uh, as a receiver. Um, you have to face the fact that the, uh, the receiver is generally from a big accounting firm. He's representing a large financial institution. There's a couple of deep pockets for the, the tort lawyers and their clients to get their hands into. So that, that's become a real problem. Much more now than in the past, if a receiver is appointed in this kind of a business, the, um, the uh, secure creditor is inclined to shut it down just to avoid the risk of liability. The um, other example I give of regulatory is, is the Environmental Protection Act. Um, we had a misfortunate appointment some years ago. We were called in on cosmetics company. Uh, they'd had some difficulties for some time. Uh, they found one, uh, one quick way to improve their cash flow, which was they decided to become a hazardous waste storage site. Um, they had 34 barrels of PCBs on site, which they weren't licensed to have. It took us four years to get them off. Um, over the space of four years of paying rent and all of these other things, we used all the money from the assets and half a million dollars worth of the secured creditors' money to do it. Um, we would have done it in three years, but some fool took his train off the line in Mississauga, and there was a big fire, and that sort of put things back a little bit. So, um, you know, we, had, we have our good stories and our bad ones. On the legal side, um, fairly straightforward, mostly Lister and Dunlop type of uh, matters. Check the validity of the security. There's nothing so embarrassing as to see something you don't have a right to. Do the searches, identify who, who's out there. That helps in the planning of, of how you're going to deal with these types of creditors. Also, look at the files of the, the security holder. Very important to go through those. Um, banks and their customers particularly talk a lot as things go down, and some of them aren't well schooled in what to say or what to write in the file. And you may find that your events of default have all evaporated away through the conduct of the parties. And finally, the, uh, the lawyer's lottery, how much notice do I give these days? That's, a, that's a, real, a real tough question. That's one that I guess you're faced with all the time. You've done all your preparations. There's no other way to go. And you've appointed a receiver. What does he do to take possession? It's clearly his first objective, and uh, in his preparation phase, he's probably figured out where most of the assets are likely to be and what he should expect. And he's, uh, he's got a good idea of what he's looking for. 
once he gets there, the first person he's going to ask is the debtor as to what there is to make sure. And then at a later date, if he's really, uh, if he's being conscientious, he'll go through the company's books and records to look for any other assets that might be overlooked. Security, I'm talking about physical security here, security for tangible assets or the, the tangible evidence of intangible assets. Um, in a small business, essentially the owner-manager is the security system. He knows where everything is, he keeps his eyes open and his ears alert. When you're appointed a receiver in that situation, unless you're very comfortable with that individual, you have to change the locks, you have to establish control of the premises, you probably either have to put your own staff on site or uh, hire security guards. Um, in larger businesses, there's probably a system of management controls, which is effectively the security system, and the receiver can get away much more cheaply by effectively taking over the supervision of those, uh, those people, the shipping clerk, the, uh, the, the guard at the gate, and, and just doing test checks of what they've done. Intangibles are a particular problem when taking possession. Uh, usually, all you've got for intangibles is some paper. Most of it is technical. Uh, accounts receivable, I guess, is the obvious example that's straightforward, but engineering know-how, these kinds of, th of things. Um, it's not at all unusual for someone from the office when they're going home at night to have some papers under their arm. Uh, you can't really stop and search everybody. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing when a receiver goes in and takes possession to protect intangibles. He really doesn't know what he's looking for. He may know that there are this sort of body of expertise, but what, what makes that up, and what's essential to it, is, is very difficult. Also, in the, uh, I guess in the modern time, the, the, um, the structure of manufacturing has changed, and it's, it's not unusual to subcontract some work, have it done outside, and you have to then identify what's with whom and figure out how you're gonna get it back. Um, it comes down to a trade-off. Do you pay them off? because they're probably going to start by asking you to pay their old account, or do you go to court to get it returned? If you want to run the business, you've obviously uh, got to find someone to do that job for you, and you may have to pay them off. Insurance. Um, receiver will normally, once he's appointed, go through the insurance in place, either replace it with his own, or uh, assume what's there if the insurers are willing to carry. I guess the fashion on that has flipped back and forth over the years, depending on whether it's a buyer or a seller's market in the insurance industry. Um, one priority issue that always comes up early on is, is, is the uh, premises and utilities. If you've got tangible assets, you've got to have somewhere to put them, uh, which generally means you've got to have premises, you've got to have services. Um, the landlord's rates are fairly defined, and I'll touch on those a little later. Utilities are pretty aggressive now, and they've got quite sophisticated in demanding payment uh, or cutting off supply. Last item on a possession notice is signification of accounts receivable. Uh, in the days when it was a matter of a race to the swiftest with Revenue Canada, and they were making some attempts to compete, it really wasn't difficult. You had to signify to protect your possession. Um, that really doesn't work anymore and you now are faced with deciding do you, do you signify accounts receivable right away and perhaps frighten off all your customers or do you, do you take it more slowly and, uh, and take the risk that something's going to go astray. Once you've got control, um, the next step is to identify what you've got um, so that you can at some later point account for it. We always think in terms of taking inventory, and for fixed assets, that's usually what's done right away. The problem is that most of us don't know a left-handed boring mill from a right-handed screwdriver, and so um, the lists are, are difficult to put together. You can get outside services to help. Um, my own route of preference these days is to take a camera or a video camera with you when you take possession. It's a lot easier to identify something if you've got a picture. For the uh, operating uh, inventories, you, you have a problem. It's costly, it's time consuming, and if you're hoping to sell the business shortly, you're almost certainly gonna have to count the inventories when you sell. So do you disrupt production to take an inventory count right at the time of your appointment, perhaps mess up your shipments? Or do you rely on the accounting system of the debtor? Um, in most cases, the reason he's in trouble is he didn't have a good accounting system 
And uh, so that's, 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 that's a, a difficult one. A compromise which, which can be used is to, is to count the valuable items. Uh, basic rule of 75%, 25%. That 75% of the value is in 25% of the items. If you count those, you won't be too far wrong. And again, pictures always help. We had one classic example of a person. Uh, it was a crane sales operation. And he swore up and down that we had not accounted for one of the items in inventory in the yard. And so we got the, uh, got the site plan and had him point to us where it was. And then we got out our book of pictures and we showed him a picture of that spot taken on the day we were appointed. And there was a big gap there. There was nothing there. He never did take that complaint to court. So uh, it, it's a real protection. Updating records. Um, to some degree, it, it is worth doing. Certainly, accounts receivable records have to be updated to get a balance. Um, if the business isn't going to be run, then not only do you update those records, but you put together whatever you're going to need to collect them, shipping records, invoices, order forms, and those kinds of things. Lastly, assets belonging to others. Um, try very hard not to, uh, not to hang on too long to things that belong to others, but you've got to identify whose they are. You've got to satisfy yourself that they legitimately belong to somebody else before you release them. And perhaps you may want to keep them if it's at least equipment for manufacturing. Uh, the, uh, the first and toughest decision for a receiver on appointment. Um, you've got a business in crisis. You've got all kinds of problems. You've got employees who are wondering where the payroll checks are and should they come to work tomorrow. You, you have to deal with this problem essentially in two ways. You make a short-term decision, usually which is going to govern you for three or four days, and then that gives you time to make the long-term one. The options are really quite broad. Um, I'll just run through them quickly. You can operate as normal, try to be a going concern. You can sustain that for some length of time, but not indefinitely. You can complete the season. And here I would think of the clothing industry. You may have a whole production run started and cut. You may want to go through the season, service the orders, collect the receivables that are already outstanding by, by fulfilling those needs. You may have a business which, um, for example, a kitchen cabinet manufacturer who's supplying the, um, the contracting industry. You have a series of orders on hand. You have receivables relating to those contracts. You may decide to produce those orders only to protect your receivables. Um, basically, most manufacturing, you start with something that's worth something, you turn it into something that's worthless, called work in process, and then you turn it into something even more valuable. So uh, when all else fails, um, you have to look at your work in process and, and decide whether you're better to complete it and to finish goods and sell it as finished goods or uh, sell it as work in process or scrap it. The last one, which is really an option in the distribution industry, is where you sell from existing finished goods um, and perhaps buy some high turnover items. And you can run a business. We've run a business for up to six months without uh, fully committing to purchasing, just turning over and gradually winding down the slow-moving items. And then the last resort is you liquidate. I'm a little short of time here. Yeah. Whip along. Just to quickly run through how you make your decision, um, these things are governed by cash flow rather than profit and loss calculations. So you do a, a cash flow calculation, match that up with an assessment of the risks. Will the customers deal with you? Will the employees stay around? Will the suppliers supply? Will the other parties who have interests cooperate? And what are the liabilities you assume or the regulations that you have to comply with to operate? When you've got the cash flow worked out, and remember when you're talking to your suppliers and customers, the customers want to pay a discount because they're not getting warranties. The suppliers want a premium because they've already been skimmed once. So that impacts your cash flow. Once you've got a fix on the cash flow and the risks, you have to say, is it worth my while also in terms of the uh, impact on realizations? I got the expression liquidation versus going concern. Uh, my caution is that a receiver's going concern is not a going concern in anyone else's sense. Everybody knows when they talk to a receiver that he can't last forever. He can go for a while, but gradually customers will seek alternative sources of supply. Employees will find other jobs. 
and eventually he'll close down. So what you're, what you're looking at in a going concern value is someone who'll pay you a buck more than liquidation. So it's, it's often not a real concern. The areas where it can be important is in retail leases. If you have a bankruptcy to preserve the lease for sale, a lot of retail leases will require that you operate as a term of the lease. So you may be in the position where you operate the business at a loss so you can sell the, the lease, the intangible, through the bankruptcy proceedings. Making that decision, it's one you can clearly be second-guessed on, and the score sheet comes in at the end of the receivership. Um, a smart receiver will look and see whose ox is being gored, and will go talk to them and ask them what they think he should do. If they don't agree with him, he may offer them the chance to underwrite losses, um, really as a way of setting up a defense. And this is one of the differences between a, a private and a court appointment, in that the private appointment, you have to do it by consultation and wait to be judged at a later date. In a court appointment, you can't usually go to court before you start to operate and get approval, but you can report to the court quickly after you've been operating for a very short period, and that gives people a chance to raise objections if they doing, doing, think you're doing the wrong thing. Next phase, realization of assets. Um, first step, of course, is notice requirements, and I guess the two to mention are the Mortgages Act and the PPSA. The receiver's job is to, is to make some choice on the approach to realization. Um, auctions are easy. Um, they're expensive. You're talking probably a 15% commission on the gross proceeds, perhaps another 5% in costs plus renting premises for 30 to 60 days at the receiver's expense to conduct one. Um, they are essentially the, the, the method of last resort for disposing. Um, public tender, the advantage of public tender is it sets a deadline. It, uh, it has a little bit of an aura of being fair, although in fact it's a rather restrictive format and most people who are buyers are suspicious that their offers are gonna be shopped it never, it never ceases to amaze me how often if you have a 12 o'clock deadline for tenders, you don't see one before 10 to 12. It's not because they haven't had time to get ready. It's because they don't trust you to hold on to their paper. Um, my preference on a public tender is if I've got a number of things, like maybe a chain of retail stores or something like that for sale, is to put them up for public tender. You're doing relatively small sales. The, the disadvantages of the restrictive format of a tender are overcome by the efficiencies you gain in having a quick, clean sale. Um, if you're doing something larger, then uh, I would favor going to the, the private contract um, as it's more flexible. What does the receiver have to do to justify himself? He has to provide evidence of value. Uh, appraisals, one, certainly. Uh, two, especially if you want to do a quick sale. Um, Fortunately, the, uh, the jurisprudence, I guess, is getting clearer and clearer that when it comes down to it, it's the marketplace is much more convincing to a judge than appraisals, and uh, that's, that's good. That points you then to the other side, which is doing your advertising, doing a credible job of advertising, and keeping a good record of negotiations. How many people made inquiries? How many people toured the plant? How many people submitted offers? What were those offers? What were their comments? All of that builds up a very convincing case. Finally, um, the protection again of the major decision, consult the other parties. If you've got a subsequent secured creditor or a, a debtor who is a guarantor, whoever is exposed here, give them the opportunity to make suggestions as to how you dispose. Give them the opportunity to bid. Give them the opportunity to introduce people. All of these are defensive maneuvers. Certainly, um, for a private appointment, that's very important. For a court appointment, you have the, the protection that you make your sale as subject to court approval and then go to court before you close. The, the risks for the receiver are therefore much less. Just quickly run down here a list. I won't touch on all of them. Landlords, monopolies I've spoken about, possessory liens, that's the goods with third parties. Employees. You have both the arrears of wages and the, uh, the trusts, and also a lot of employee benefit packages which you may have to pay the existing account to maintain. Leased equipment, is it valid? 
Is it a security which is not perfected? Are you ahead? Who's behind? Can you hold on to it? Uh, do you need to hold on to it? Lots of questions to address. Consignments. Uh, consignment is another word like receiverships. Everybody means it slightly differently. And uh, it, you get a confusion, uh, a fact, I guess, arising out of the confusion of terminology because consignments are so often very poorly documented that the two people who arranged them had different intents in mind when they, when they put them together. I mentioned the prior security interests in the deemed trusts. Uh, those, uh, certainly the deemed trusts, tend to be dealt with at the end when the, uh, when the receivership's over. Okay. I guess just before concluding, I make the comments on reporting accounting and fees, and we are running a trifle late, so I'll be very brief. Um, the private receiver, he's responsible to the creditor who appoints him. He reports to that creditor. Usually, within a month, gives a first report with an estimate of realizations and a strategy. Reports after that probably monthly giving updates on the estimate, statements of receipts and disbursements, and uh, a report of his activities. While a privately appointed receiver will generally talk to outsiders, um, he doesn't volunteer in accounting. Uh, there's usually someone who is vulnerable, uh, particularly guarantors, to the outcome of a receivership. Um, it's fairly standard practice now that if you're called on a guarantee, the first thing you do is sue the receiver for negligence. So receivers are somewhat shy about handing out an accounting which someone can then pick over. To get an accounting from a privately appointed receiver, really a creditor or an interested party is left in going to court to get it, and that's, generally speaking, sufficient discouragement. Um, a court-appointed receiver must report. Um, I would say good practice to do so at least once a year. Uh, you go more frequently when you're needing instructions. And those reports do include an accounting, so any interested party can get access to the receiver's accounting. Fees, uh, almost universally based on time spent at professional rates and for a privately appointed receiver paid at once he receives approval from the secured creditor. Court appointed receiver usually charges on the same basis, uh, usually has to get the approval of the court and very often separately both for the quantum and the payment. Um, we usually try to get approval in the order appointing us to take fees as they accrue and then get them taxed. Uh, our own principle is once every six months, at least once every year. Um, and that's really because when you come to tax your fees as a court appointed receiver, you've got to be able to justify them and it helps to have a fairly fresh memory. Finally, when everything is over, uh, the court appointed receiver can go to court and get his discharge, get final passing of his accounts, final taxation of his fees, close his file. Private receiverships tend to be like the good soldier. They, uh, they never die, they just slowly fade away. There's always something that lingers, and by the time the, the something that lingers gets wound up, there's no one around who wants to take the time to write a letter saying the engagement's at an end. So they, they, they sort of drift into oblivion. Okay, I was going to summarize, but perhaps uh, perhaps we should pause and take questions seeing as we're running rather late. Do you have any questions in the audience? Yeah. Uh, I'm just starting with the, uh, the options you indicated in the realization of assets. It creates the appearance of conflict, and um, what you have to do then is not only have good appraisal data, but you have to essentially set it up as a competitive environment. Um, all too often you have a, um, a situation that's gone bad. You have a reasonably amicable relationship between a, a debtor and a lender, and they come to you and say, we want to do a quick flip. And uh, you know, my, my response to that is thanks, but no thanks. It just isn't worth it for any of us because there's always someone out there who's going to call foul. Um, so while I would give an interested party, a debtor, an opportunity to bid, and very often they're the logical bidder because they know the, the package better than anybody else, um, you really do need to have overwhelming evidence that you're getting good value before you take that kind of a route. 
That's right. That's right. Yes, uh, if I recall the Federal Bankruptcy Act, there were a number of proposed provisions which are going to impact on trustees. What, what is the status of that? Is that going to come uh, in the near future? The latest word? In so, well, insofar as receivership is concerned uh, and other areas, the federal government is busy drafting provisions which we could be out before the end of the summer. I would imagine we might see a bill before the fall election, if there's going to be an election in the fall. As a cynic, I'll tell you my view is that uh, in as much as the proposal provides for the payment of employee wage claims, it's good election material. So it'll be tabled in the House before the election almost for sure. I doubt it'll be passed. I don't think there's time. Are there any other questions on receivership area, private court? All crystal clear. Yes? I've never seen anyone use it, no. no I mean, I they have in Alberta. The Canada Business Corporations Act is um, has um, part in there dealing with uh, rights for creditors, and it's um, the Alberta Act, Alberta Business Corporations Act. Uh, New Brunswick has a Business Corporations Act. Uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba have a Business Corporations Act, which provide for unsecured trade creditors applying to the court to direct receivers to account. And um, if I'm not mistaken, they have to account at least uh, once every six months, if not once a year. Ontario does not have it. Our Business Corporation Act is silent. Yeah, the, the Federal Business Corporation Act allows creditors to, in fact, apply to the court as the high-risk receiver or employee. That's correct. It's not, it's not used, um, at least not in this province, because many, many, many companies that are in receivership are incorporated under the Provincial Act, so you don't get its application. Are there any other questions in the receivership area? We're running a little bit behind time. Perhaps we'll have a short coffee break for about 10 minutes and come back and do the last part of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, the Department of Education would appreciate very much your completing the um, evaluation form. Uh, there's a general rating which uh, is number question number one in presentation of any particular program. It's also rating the speakers, presentations, future CLE programs, anything you'd like. And on the back of the evaluation form, it sets out a number of different types of formats, half days, full days, Saturdays, evenings, whatever. And it also has some particulars about your practice, uh, whether you're uh, new graduate or been out many years. Uh, this is necessary, as you can appreciate, so that the Law Society can plan programs for next fall, next winter, or whatever, and to keep up with the competition, whether it be the Canadian Bar Association or other private interest groups. It's for you, so complete it and, and hand it in, please. For the next uh, two speakers is, is uh, Bob Sanderson and, and Gordon Morantz. If he shows up, if he doesn't, so I'll have to improvise on bankruptcy. Uh, Bob uh, Sanderson is president of Thorne, Ernst & Winnie Lid, and uh, he comes from out west in BC. He's now uh, in Ontario and flies back and forth. He's been involved in many, many major and minor uh, insolvencies and bankruptcies. Um, he's also been involved in receiverships in the overmath with bankruptcy. And uh, he's here to tell you his uh, checklist and review list on what he does as a trustee, what his office does, and instructions that he gives to people across Canada. Bob? Okay, in the material that, uh, that you've received is the checklist, and I'm... Uh, not going to really fall it. I'll probably leap around a fair bit. Uh, and what I hope to try and do uh, this afternoon in uh, sort of 30 minutes is 
uh, get you thinking a little bit. Uh, maybe leave you with some ideas and some thoughts and what have you that uh, uh, when you are confronted with a situation, uh, you can uh, have some idea of where you might want to head to try and solve it. Uh, bankruptcy is, uh, is a little different than receiverships. Alan uh, has given you uh, uh, an overview of uh, what a receiver, uh, receiver does, and he was speaking in the very specific uh, uh, area where you're acting for a secured creditor to realize on security. Uh, a trustee in bankruptcy is a little different. Uh, the trustee acts for the unsecured creditors. At least that was the theory of the act in any event. It's also important to uh, uh, be a lawyer or an accountant or whoever, it's important to, to think about where you're coming from. Who are you representing? Are you representing the creditor? Are you representing the debtor? Or are you going to represent the trustee? Well, I'm sure the lawyers in the, the audience have quickly figured out that there's three assignments that, uh, that might be available uh, immediately out of any uh, particular bankruptcy proceeding, if not more. Keeping that in mind and that framework as to who you're going to work for, who you're, if you're looking after the rights of a creditor, uh, are you acting for the debtor? Um, you also have to uh, uh, keep in mind a little bit, although the legislation is identical, whether it's a, a personal uh, bankruptcy uh, or a, a business, a corporation, because there is, uh, there is some subtle differences that you want to keep in mind. I find in my practice it's always useful to go back and consider what the uh, uh, purpose of the act was. Why was it put in place? Why do we have bankruptcy legislation? What, was, what were the legislators trying to accomplish? Because uh, sometimes if you can understand uh, uh, what they were trying to do, it helps you and try to administer it. Uh, the beauty of the Bankruptcy Act is it's nice and thin. and. Uh, and uh, there was a question on whether the changes were going to be made to the legislation or not. To some extent, I hope not, uh, because all that will happen is uh, it will become more complicated. Uh, although maybe I should look upon that as sort of the Fair Employment Act. The uh, tax accountants and lawyers got theirs back in 1972 when we had a new tax act, and it's progressively got worse since. There's set out in uh, Holden and Morowitz on bankruptcy law 11 uh, uh, purposes or objectives. Uh, all of them premised on the fact that this is to be a businessman's act. It's created to allow those who are the beneficiaries to have a say, to have a determination in what the result finally is. And it's important that you approach it from that point of view, in my opinion. It's important that you look at it as a businessman's act, that it, that it's, that it doesn't turn into... Uh, a legal uh, wrangling. Now, to an audience uh, of, of lawyers, that's maybe the wrong thing to say, but uh, uh, unless you subscribe to the ethere theory of why uh, fritter the state away and the beneficiaries, uh, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Because there are very few things that are back black and white when dealing with an insolvency. Uh, one seminar I was at, the uh, guest speaker was uh, a judge in family law. Uh, and uh, the first part of her speech was an equation of the distribution in a divorce as compared to a bankruptcy proceeding. And that's what you're really doing. It's the same thing. You're splitting the spoils up among the beneficiaries. And what the Bankruptcy Act does is provides a set of rules that allows the trustee to carry that out. So the, the key, one of the key purposes is to provide for a fair and orderly distribution. It's to provide for an inexpensive, a uh, way of compelling an insolvent debtor to turn over his property and to provide for a proper and economical realization and an investigation into his affairs. Very comprehensive. Now, if you keep that in mind, uh, sometimes when you figure out now what you're trying to accomplish, uh, you can decide on the course of action that you really want to take. And let me give you an example. You're representing an individual uh, who has uh, guaranteed a debt. He owes hundreds of thousands of dollars. He'll never get himself out of the problem. Hopelessly insolvent. What's your advice to him? Well, the Bankruptcy Act provides that, that 
you will be discharged from your debts. And so one of the things you might consider doing is looking at uh, section 139, which, uh, and I'll quote, the making of the receiving order against or an assignment by any person except a corporation oper operates as an application for discharge unless the bankrupt by notice in writing files in the court and serves upon the trustee a waiver of the application before being served by the trustee with a notice of his intention to apply to the court for an appointment for the hearing of an application as provided in this section. We're dealing with the discharge of a bankrupt. Now the normal course of action is you go bankrupt, 21 days later you have your creditors meeting, nobody shows up. Uh, the creditors, the bankrupt and the trustee have a little chat, cup of coffee, everything's very friendly. Uh, you then uh, move on and between three months, but before the end of 12, the trustee brings an application for the bankrupt's discharge. But our individual who's your client is hopelessly insolvent. And yet he can make an excellent contribution to society. He may be a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, a buyer of tax shelters, whatever. Um, <laughs> And so what you do is, simultaneously with making the assignment, you file a notice with the court and deliver it to the trustee, so the trustee never has an opportunity to make an appointment for your discharge. And you set down the application for the bankrupt's discharge in the day after the first meeting of creditors and require the trustee to file his first report as required. It has been done, 22 days after going bankrupt. Individuals have been completely discharged. Now this probably hasn't been done all that often on Ontario. I'm certainly aware of it being done out west, but maybe if the real estate market out here uh, uh, slows down a little bit, there'll be lots of individuals who might be able to afford themselves of this. Will it work? I don't know. I always operate, if you don't try, you never find out. There's a course of action, you've got somebody you want to get to a certain place. Was it really what the act was intended to do? I don't know. The governments that pass the legislation are the same ones that try to interfere with the orderly and fair distribution. They've now brought Section 224 into the Income Tax Act to try and get priority ahead of that which was given them in their own legislation. There's a, a question I'll raise, and then uh, as either Frank can answer it, I'll have to ask the question again for Gordon when he gets here. Uh, but the question is, you want to, you're representing a receiver. And the receiver's trying to collect a, a, a receivable. And he petitions for bankruptcy. Will the petition be successful? Well, there is a recent decision this week in, <laughs> in Alberta which says that a receiver won't be. And the reason was that uh, he brought the petition in his name rather than in the name of the debtor. A creditor, I should say. Now, the other thing when you're looking at the Bankruptcy Act and you're advising, and again, the, the pre-planning, and Alan talked about it in a receivership, but to many, in many respects, what, are, what a receiver does, assessing the situation, obtaining the appointment, taking possession of the assets, deciding on a course of action, be it to operate or liquidate, and then realizing and distributing is not an awful lot different than the sequence of events in a bankruptcy. But the bankruptcy is governed uh, by some very specific rules and forms and steps that everybody must comply with. But let's say you're advising a debtor that uh, operates a business and uh, he realized he was getting into trouble, so he transferred uh, the house to his wife, or he uh, granted a mortgage on the uh, warehouse to uh, uh, his son, or what have you. Or he knew that uh, if, when he wanted to get back into business next month, that uh, the only way he was going to do it was if his key supplier over here was paid. 
and yet he knows he's in financial difficulty, what should he do? Well, he probably doesn't want to go bankrupt because of the fraudulent conveyance and uh, uh, fraudulent preference sections. But maybe what he wants to do is file a proposal, a holding proposal. And uh, with a bit of luck, he can smoke it by the trustee. And uh, three months or a year may go by before anything happens. The proposal is approved by the creditors, approved by the court. It goes bankrupt a year down the road. And all of a sudden, he's in a position where maybe he's still subject to attack, but the hurdle you've got to jump is much more, uh, much more difficult. Alan mentioned about landlords and receiverships and how leases, uh, particularly in a real estate market like we've got in Toronto, can be very valuable. And that a trustee, by having the tenant go bankrupt, you can protect that lease. And the question has been raised and argued as to whether or not that's a proper use of the act. Is it a proper use for the receiver to, in effect, directly or indirectly cause a bankruptcy so as to preserve the lease to the detriment of the landlord who also will be a creditor? And the case law has come down and said that that is, in fact, a legitimate use of the act. The problem with that, though, is like the recent case out in British Columbia, I think it was about uh, three or four months ago, where the receiver seeing that uh, got the bright idea that to protect the, uh, the, the lease, which was important, and to uh, secure the best uh, uh, realization for the secured creditor, remember who the trustee is acting for, um, the company was put in bankruptcy and he was the trustee. Now, admittedly, the trustee and the receiver was a little sloppy. He never opened a separate file. He never opened a separate time docket. When he paid the rent, he used a check payable on the receiver's bank account rather than one payable on the trustee's bank account. And then he tried to walk away from a $70,000 liability for rent. And the court said, no, you couldn't distinguish between the two. So if you're going to do this, you've got to be careful. Which leads me to the next thing you have to consider when you're looking at a bankruptcy, is do you have a conflict of interest? A very important consideration. Is it a conflict of interest for the receiver and the trustee to be one and the same? Is there a conflict to be considered where the trustee is asked by the secured creditor to realize on his security? And the only answer I can give you is no two situations are going to be the same and every one of them requires the trustee or his solicitor to exercise professional judgment and to put the test of what a reasonable person would do. The other thing to consider in looking at a bankruptcy particularly a personal bankruptcy, is the debts that are not discharged. In Section 148, it's always useful, particularly uh, where there's been marital problems or fraud or what have you, to uh, take a close look at that. Uh, certainly there's, there's situations where people have come to a rude awakening, thinking that they would be discharged from certain debts when in fact they weren't. Now, essentially, a trustee in bankruptcy can be appointed in three ways, as a result of an assignment in bankruptcy, as a result of a petition for a receiving order, or as a result of filing a proposal under Part 3 of the Bankruptcy Act. For the rest of the afternoon, I will ignore proposals. Essentially, once you're appointed, it doesn't matter whether it was a petition for a receiving order or an assignment in bankruptcy. You're going to take possession, you're going to gather in the assets, and you're going to carry out the investigation that you must carry out so that you can report to the first meeting of creditors. The first meeting of creditors is really the first opportunity that the creditors, the unsecured creditors, if you like, of the debtor have an opportunity to hopefully obtain a clear understanding of what went wrong and what they're entitled to receive. 
Unfortunately, very few creditors come to creditors' meetings anymore because in the majority of cases, the dividend is so small that it's not worth showing up. However, you never know when you might find out something useful. When you, as a creditor, can contribute something. And remember I talked about this being a businessman's act. The creditors at the first meeting of creditors have an opportunity to provide information to the trustee, to provide instruction to the trustee as to what they wish to have happen. Don't take that as a mandate to try and instruct the trustee to go off on a wild goose chase all over the world, chasing down the bank account that everybody thought the person had but really doesn't. Look at it from a businessman's point of view. What's the risk reward? Would you buy a widget for 80 cents only to sell it for 75? No. So why spend $10,000 chasing something that you're not even sure whether it exists or not? Or when you find it, might only have $5,000 in it. It makes no sense. And that comes to probably the, the most important thing that must be considered by a trustee prior to taking his appointment. And that is, how is he going to be paid? I mean, let's get right down to the bottom line. Because once you are appointed, you have an obligation to complete the administration of the estate no matter what. And with governments racing around trying to create legislation to get super priorities and secured creditors trying to get in for their pound of flesh, if you're not careful, you can do a lot of work for a lot of other people for which you never get paid. So if you're representing somebody that wants to go bankrupt, make sure you get a retainer and uh, get one sufficiently large. Once appointed, if the trustee refuses to take an action, there is an avenue for the creditors to exercise, and I understand uh, Gordy's going to cover that under Section 20, so I will just leave that for him to, to pick up on. Obviously, once the, uh, the first meeting of creditors is, uh, is held, the, uh, the creditors have elected their representatives to work with the trustee, the inspectors. The inspectors meet and they decide on a course of action. It's important that the inspectors be knowledgeable of the business, that they be open and frank with the trustee, and that they but they not be afraid to question what the trustee's doing. Nothing is worse from a trustee's perspective than having inspectors who just sit there and say yes, no. It's useful to have people that are knowledgeable of the industry. Accountants don't spend a lot of time working in every different business that exists in the Canadian economy. But the people that supply to that business, be it a paint distributor or a widget manufacturer, they know the business because they sell to it. And they can provide you with useful insight into how you might sell it, where to look for assets, what the guy was up to. They've, they've been selling to him for a long time. They can be very useful. And that can be a very important step in, in an administration is getting good inspectors, who will work with the trustee in trying to affect the uh, realization that will provi provide the greatest distribution. Now, it's also about the time, first time of the first meeting of creditors that you have to decide whether you want to file a proof of claim or not. Now, in any assignment where there's going to be a distribution, trustees or their staff spend an inordinate amount of time correcting proof of claims that have been filled in wrong. Uh, asking for information that should have been uh, supplied in the first place. 
But the trustees are always in a dilemma. You never know when the, tr the proof of claim is first filed whether you should take the time to have it put right or to wait until you know there's going to be some money. And it's a real catch-22, because why spend all that time going through a whole bunch of proofs of claim, checking them, requesting information, setting up disallowance proceedings if you don't agree with the claim, when you're never going to pay a dividend. On the other hand, if you wait until you know you've got the money, and all the creditors have know you've got the money, guess what? They want a dividend. Can you blame them? But of course, you haven't done the work. Always a catch-22 and a judgment call. But there may be situations where, if you're representing a creditor, you don't want to file a proof of claim. You certainly may not want to file one at the first meeting of, for the first meeting of creditors. If any of you have ever looked at a proof of claim, there is a requirement uh, on the proof of claim that you disclose any uh, payments received or property returned within three months from the date of the bankruptcy or, if you're related, 12 months. So trustees just love it. You file a proof of claim, you attach your schedule saying that you're owed $10,000, and then you put, yes, I received $400,000 three days ago. I mean, you've just drawn to the attention of the trustee a fraudulent preference that he might not otherwise have seen. Now, probably at $400,000, he might have seen it. But, but think about it. Are you likely to get a 99% dividend? If you're going to get a 99% dividend, the guy probably wouldn't have gone bankrupt. So maybe it's better to wait and see what happens. There's no requirement to file a proof of claim for the first meeting of creditors. Most trustees will send a notice out under Section 120 indicating that they will be paying a dividend within 30 days and you've got 30 day, or giving you 30 days to file a proof of claim. That tends to be custom in the, in the profession. It's not a requirement, but it's custom. So maybe you sit back and wait. I recall a number of years ago where there was a, a situation in, uh, in the province of Quebec, as I recall, where the uh, creditors decided amongst themselves that they weren't going to uh, push for any uh, tax on fraudulent preferences. Part of the reason was they'd all taken them. And it was just, uh, just difficult to figure out who'd won in the race, that was all. And the trustee had a devil of a time because he could see some classic fraudulent preferences. He couldn't get the inspectors to uh, authorize him to take the action. He couldn't find a creditor to take the action. And he couldn't get the court convinced that he should take the action. And yet they were, they were all there. Guys had not bothered to file proofs of claim where they had them. But he could find them. So it's something to think about when you're, uh, uh, when you're depending, of course, who you're working for. The other thing that has to happen at the first meeting of creditors, or should happen if it hasn't already happened, is that the uh, trustee will want to retain an estate solicitor. Um, it's important that you have the resolution approving that uh, drawn in proper form so you're not limited to, uh, I think it's 10% uh, of the realization, Frank, um, and get a waiver of that requirement. 10% uh, of nothing is uh, not very much. Uh, that's, uh, sometimes that's where you can end up. Another question that's always a curiosity is, why secured creditors file proofs of claim unless they're asked to? I've always been puzzled by this. I can remember one institution, it was just a little personal bankruptcy, and, and they wrote a lot of money uh, for a personal bankruptcy, $25,000, and their security was a 1969 Ford Pinto, <laughs> which they valued at 200 bucks and then didn't bother to show up at the first meeting of creditors. Creditors all reached in their pocket and threw 200 bucks on the table, gave it to the trustee and said, go and buy the security. And because the security, this was out in British Columbia, because the security was financed under a chattel mortgage, which gave you either a seizure or supervision, 
We were able to argue successfully that in effect they had elected to seize by valuing their security and as a result we had extinguished a $25,000 debt for $200, raised the dividend of the unsecureds from 10 cents to 50 cents on the dollar. But the automatic reaction is if you represent banks, you're going to phone and say, we've got to file proof of claim. I don't know why. Wait. See what happens. Ask for your security. Don't be in a rush. Don't make it easy for the trustee. <coughs> Unless you're the unsecured creditors looking to get a higher realization, of course. In the... Uh, this morning, uh, second to last speaker this morning was talking in mortgage realizations about the standard of care in realizations. I suggest to you that uh, probably applies in the bankruptcy as well. Trustee has a little, uh, a little comfort, though. He's got some inspectors. And in uh, Section 14 of the Act, it provides that uh, the trustee may do certain things with the permission of the inspectors or with the authorization of the inspectors, one of which is to sell. I'll submit that that doesn't mean the trustee has to get the inspector's permission to sell. He can sell on his own. He may have to sell on his own. He may have to sell assets off before the first meeting of creditors. And he does have the authority to do it, in my opinion. If he's careful, he'll probably try and get a, a registrar or a, somebody like that to uh, bless a little court order for him. Um, but I'll submit that that's not even necessary either. So if you're representing a purchaser from a trustee, it's not necessary, I'll submit, for you to have the inspector's approval. It's just super comfort. What are we doing, Frank? Yeah, I was just going to see here. There was. Uh... I think I'll leave it at that. And if there's any questions, uh, be pleased to answer them. Or try to answer them. Yeah. Uh, when a, you are approached by a, an individual, or indeed maybe an individual in a corporation mm -hmm. that is approaching bankruptcy, since you wear so many hats as a trustee, do you caution that person who is approaching you uh, as to the fact that anything they, that he or she tells you is not privileged? Indeed, you will have to use it uh, for the benefit of the unsecured creditors. Depends. Uh, probably the most difficult, the, the most difficult situation, is uh, is in personal bankruptcies. Individuals. Uh, uh, the person comes to you. They're usually distraught. Uh, you know, where do I go next? What do I do? Uh, you know, the bailiffs at the door trying to seize my TV or whatever. Um, and so, to a large extent, you do become a counselor. And you say, well, look, this is how we can handle this problem. And you sort of take them down the path. At the same time, you have to tell them, as you say, but by the way, as soon as you're bankrupt, I don't represent you anymore. And if, if I find something happening that I don't like, bang, I'm coming. Uh, much more difficult in the corporate situation. And uh, uh, I guess to some extent uh, in the corporate situation, it can also be easier because you do have the powers of investigation. And uh, to some extent, if, uh, if the, the, the person that's coming to see you has also got his shareholder's loan and he's owed a bunch of money as an unsecured creditor as well, well, maybe uh, there's something in it for him to, uh, to cooperate and put all the cards on the table. On the other hand, if he doesn't want to, uh, that's fine. And it's difficult. Uh, usually where there's a corporation and guarantees involved, just send them off to a solicitor. Depends, depends what it's all, you know. Again, you've got to exercise the professional judgment, I'll suggest. 
One follow-up. Sure. Okay. Where do you get the authority to sell without the approval of the inspectors? Um, Yeah, be, well, before the first meeting, the, the, the Act specifically authorizes it in, uh, in Section 14, is it, Frank? Uh, well, and in Section 14 also it says, the trustee may, and I suggest to you it's permissive, with the permission of the inspectors, do all or any of the following things. Now, it's a pretty rare circumstance where you can't get inspector's approval once they're, they're appointed. Um, but prior to, prior to, to preserve and protect, that the trustees got the obligation to, uh, uh, to preserve and protect the uh, property as soon as he's appointed and to uh, take conservatory measures, including disposing, which is under uh, Section 12.7. Okay, so he's got that as well. Um, mm -hmm. There has been considerable discussion and panel discussions over the years as to the duties of a trustee and who does he represent. And I note that on <clears throat> your pre-appointment exhibit A, under item one, you say confirm <laughs> bankruptcy as an appropriate course of action. The question is as follows. Do you feel it is proper for a trustee in bankruptcy to advise a debtor to file an assignment in bankruptcy? Or alternatively, you would have the right to advise them not to and to suggest alternate uh, procedures, alternative procedures? Well, generally when they come to you, and I'm going to try and answer this by example if I can. I recognize that in the first instance it is a pseudo or quasi-relationship, client relationship. Nevertheless, you're appointed by the court, and I'm just posing the question, do you feel it's proper for a trustee to advise a debtor to file an assignment in bankruptcy? Short answer, sure. Um, is it any different than advising him not to file bankruptcy, to file a proposal, to avail himself of the order of payment of debts, to uh, try and make a, a private compromise with his creditors, uh, uh, to, uh, if he's a corporation, to reorganize under the uh, 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 CABC or the Companies Creditors Arrangements Act? Um, I suggest that what the trustee's doing or the individual's doing at that point is offering courses of action uh, from a business perspective that uh, uh, certainly uh, other than uh, some very simple proceedings, uh, he's going to have to get a lawyer involved uh, as well to explain his rights, at which point there's th that uh, that's what uh, would take over. Yes? Under the statutes as it was written at that time, yes. Uh, probably. They might be able to. I'm, I'm not, I'm, to be quite frank, I'm not that uh, familiar with the PPSA and how you deal with deficiencies. It is an unsecured claim. Now, yeah, no one, the, the example I was using was very specific because it was the, the legislation was the uh, Chattel Mortgages Act of, uh, of British Columbia at the time and it had a very specific Caesar supervision in it. And that's how we, we managed to handle that. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you very much. We come to the end of the, the day and the end of the creditor and debtor course in the bar admission. And um, pleased to uh, say that Gordon Morans did make it because I was going over his outline in the event that I had to improvise. Uh, Gordon is a partner with the law firm of Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt in Toronto. He's got a Master's of Law. He's my 
predecessor as the head of section for the bar admission course on creditors and debtors rights. He's a good friend and he's a terrible enemy at times. Um, Gordon is going to cover legal proceedings in a bankruptcy situation, which is where you come in as solicitor for a creditor, a solicitor for a debtor, solicitor for a creditor against, with, against whom a trustee has brought a preference action, a settlement action, or a reviewable trans transaction. Gordon is also going to talk about uh, what you can do when the trustee says at the first meeting of creditors, as Bob Sanderson says, there's no money there. Take Section 20 proceedings. And Section 20 under the Bankruptcy Act is a marvelous remedy for you, a solicitor for a smaller creditor where you think you've been done in, probably have been done in, and that's a provision where you can bypass a trustee in bankruptcy and acquire the rights of a trustee in bankruptcy to set aside preferences, settlements, and reviewable transactions. Do you want to finish the rest of the material for me? <laughs> I've been upstaged here. I mean, he comes in with his gown on. <laughs> no, I'm not even on your first page. <laughs> Without more, uh, Gordon Morantz. <laughs> Allow me. No, thank you. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for waiting around for me. You don't know what a great compliment it is to know that you stuck it out and it looks like it's a gorgeous afternoon. Um, my book is two parts. The first is the material on this dreadful motion we've been on all day, and the rest is uh, the outline material and some backup. I'm not. <laughs> Frank and I are good friends, but we also have a tendency to go at each other hammer and tongs when we're on the opposite sides of files, and we seem to be on the opposite sides of files more and more often. Fortunately, our wives don't let that get in the way of things. That's one of the nice things, I think, about practicing at the bankruptcy bar, and those of you who have had any exposure to it find that uh, counsel do a hell of a job for their clients, but they also manage to keep personalities and personal things out of it. They maintain their friendship, they fight hard in court, and they do carry on outside of court in a very amicable fashion. And it happens, I think, most often in insolvency courts because you run across the same people all the time. Which leads me to the point that if you come in as an outsider, you sometimes wonder what's going on because people are very friendly and very cozy. Um, but the system works, and I think it works largely because although the statute is antiquated and not terribly helpful in many respects, either in receivership or insolvency matters, counsel uh, realize that you want a result. Uh, they work together. A lot of the stuff needn't be adversarial. Having said that, let's be adversarial and talk about petitions. I'm not going to take you chapter and verse and you go here and you go there because it's in the material. I want to point out to you some of the hazards. I will finish at 4.30. Um, and if I don't, you can sort of get up and walk out. I'll get the hint. <clears throat> but I want to talk about some of the little pitfalls, maybe the tricks of the trade to avoid you getting into trouble. The petition obviously has to allege a debt of not less than $1,000. That amount has been in the act for a long time. Bankruptcy is a very extreme remedy. One wonders whether $1,000 is a realistic limit to bring into play such, a, you know, such an extreme measure or remedy. Um, you allege the debt, you must also allege an act of bankruptcy. Now, Section 24 sets them all out. You're familiar with most of them. Uh, failure to pay your liabilities as they fall due, allowing a writ of execution to be outstanding. That's not what the statute says, but that's the short version. And then there's the exhibiting a statement of a, sta a financial statement or a statement to a meeting of your creditors to show that you're insolvent. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that if the debtor shows you a financial statement that shows him to be insolvent, that's the basis for a petition. It isn't. The private showing doesn't work. It has to be a meeting of creditors. And I guess by the same token, if you walk around and show it to a number of creditors on an individual basis, you don't quite get there. When you're drafting the petition and you're putting in the acts of bankruptcy, remember, use the wording of the statute. Do not try and be creative. 
because you've got to bring yourself within the four corners of the statute, take the wording, lift it right out of the section of the statute. That way you won't go wrong, you know what you have to prove, and you won't find your petition failing for some technical reason. The use of the bankruptcy petition uh, for purposes of collection, there used to be a saying you can't use the bankruptcy court as a collection agency. Well, if you live a while, you realize that what people say isn't what they do. And I think you find it swings up and down, but an increasing use of the petition as a means of forcing a collection. Now, you can't go out and threaten the debtor and say, if you don't pay, we'll file a petition. But if you do file the petition solely for purposes of collecting the debt, you may run into a problem because let's say the creditor wants to pay you, the debtor wants to pay you, what do you do with this petition? This is not a private lawsuit between A and B. Once you file a bankruptcy petition, you have commenced a class action. The act is a quasi-criminal statute. The class action is for the benefit of all creditors. You are no longer entitled to appropriate a benefit for yourself. You've invoked the system so that you start, the debtor says, oh my God, what have you done to me? You're the, you know, you're the only person I haven't paid. I can pay you, or how do I get rid of this? My father-in-law will lend me the money, will get rid of you. What do you do? Your obligation is to go back to the court. You can't really say it's settled. Everybody does. It's not really appropriate. Because what you've done is that debtor has paid his obligations to you. But if there are other creditors out there who are unpaid, then the court has a duty to protect them. Maybe the debtor's taken the last of his assets and given them to your client to settle a claim and left them unable to pay anybody else or string a whole bunch of others out for a longer period of time. The proper procedure is to apply to have the petition withdrawn, but in support of that application, you've got to have an affidavit from the debtor attesting to his solvency. Now, the practice gets sloppy sometimes in the courts, depending who's sitting on the bench. Some judges are more savvy about this than others. A lot depends on how long they've been in the bankruptcy court. If they're around for a little while, I pick up what's going on. So that you've got to be very careful. You have an obligation to the court, because you've started a class action, to make sure the court is not misled. And you need a firm affidavit from the debtor indicating solvency. Uh, when I'm acting for a petitioning creditor, we get into this situation. I want to see the debtor file an affidavit with a financial statement showing that he is solvent. Satisfy the court, because it's protection for me. What happens if I, my client gets paid a month down the road and other creditor petitions? Is my payment a fraudulent preference? Have I been preferred? I want that evidence before the court to show that the debtor said he was solvent under oath, and that should serve to displace any intention the debtor might have had to prefer me as a creditor. Now, before you petition, what are you getting yourself and your client into? No, first of all, in the petition, you've got to name a trustee who will act. No trustee will act for free. Not Sanderson, for sure. Not Harold. Um, who's going to pay him? Well, you say there'll be assets in the bankrupt estate. Does anybody have any idea of how many estates there are with assets in them? There are really, in terms of liquidations of businesses, not that many bankruptcies. Yeah, personal bankruptcies, yes, but not commercial because you've got receiverships. The banks and the institutional lenders and the finance companies have all of the assets tied up with security. By the time you come to realization, there may be no unencumbered assets. And remember, all the trustee can get paid out, out, of, out of are the unencumbered assets. And never mind encumbrances. You've all heard about the deemed trusts and the statutory liens that exist in favor of Her Majesty, federal and provincial, for uh, income tax deductions withheld, the uh, OHIP, vacation pay, Canada Pension Plan, and UI, unemployment insurance. Those all come right off the top. It's entirely possible that by the time a trustee in bankruptcy gets there, there are no assets. The secured creditor has a shortfall. The Crown takes their money. Who pays the trustee? And the fact is, if you're going to file a petition, your client is going to pay the trustee if there are no assets in the estate. How do you protect yourself as best you can? 
First of all, you gotta be pretty sure your client wants to start the bankruptcy process. In many cases, you find that by filing a petition, your client is doing the debtor a favor, puts him out of his misery, gives him the easy way out. You'll have to, I recommend that before you even think about filing the petition, you go out and do the full range of security searches. PPSA, uh, the Corporate Securities Registration Act, Bank Act. Find out what you can to see what the level of secured debt outstanding is. It'll give you a better fix on what you're up against. Try and get some financial information. You can try the Dun & Bradstreet reports uh, most often they're fairly useless, but they may have a gem here and there. Try and get any kind of feed on their financial position. If you see layers and layers of secured creditors, do execution searches. Uh, you'll get an idea of where the debtor stands. You'll go to the trustee and say, okay, or a client at least, and say, look, we don't know what the asset values are. We see that there are a lot of secured lenders. We don't know how much they're in for because, as you know, PPSA financing statement doesn't tell you how much the bank is financing. But unless the debtor's got a lot of unencumbered real estate or real estate with value beyond encumbrances, you may be in trouble. So you'll, you've got to deal with the trustee. The trustee will want, in most cases, rather than cash up front, assuming that the trustee knows your client and has some comfort in his credit worthiness, he will want a guarantee, an indemnity. Take your choice. We try generally to draft them not as a blanket indemnity to the trustee for all of his expenses because a trustee's administration could go on for a long time and be very expensive. What you'll want to do is indemnify the trustee for the, the essential expenses in completing the minimal administration of the estate. That gets you to the first meeting of creditors and covers his costs in reporting out. You don't want to guarantee anything more for him or indemnify him for anything more. You also want to provide that there, if there are unencumbered assets in the estate that fall into the trustee's hands, that's what he uses to pay his fees first, any shortfall you cover him for. Now there is law that says that if there are no assets in the estate, the trustee's not entitled to anything and therefore the indemnity doesn't stand. But I don't think that's entirely right. And after all, if you expect to be doing business with these people in the future, you're going to want to honor your obligations. Um, you, but you get into the problem at the first meeting of creditors when everybody jumps up and down and starts yelling about all the terrible things the debtor did and tells the trustee, let's go get them. We want an investigation. Hold on, says the trustee. Who's going to pay for the investigation? Well, they say, you know, so-and-so just guaranteed your fees, didn't they? Oh, he said, only to the first meeting of creditors and for necessary administration. If you want anything else, someone has to fund me, and we'll get into how you get funded shortly. But those are the pitfalls. The other thing is, God forbid that the creditor gives an open indemnity to the trustee, and the first thing the creditors say is, oh, the petitioning creditor got a preference two months ago before the bankruptcy. You attack him, and he's going to indemnify, pick up the cost of attacking himself? No way. I've seen that people get caught in those traps don't let it happen. Um, creditors. There is the situation very often where you can only find one creditor, and that creditor happens to be the only creditor, or the others pale in insignificance. If you've got that sort of a situation, there's a note about King Petroleum that allows the petition to stand. There's also the case, though, where you may have only one creditor petitioning and failure to pay one creditor of itself in absence of any exceptional circumstances does not constitute an act of bankruptcy. So if you're not getting paid or your client's not getting paid and he wants to petition, you better scout around to see if you can find some more creditors who will, if not join in the petition, at least be available as witnesses to come to the trial to give evidence of non-payment. So, because failure to pay generally means more than one or two creditors. Now, there can be exceptional circumstances. One was, of course, the very large debt. Um, where there's a suggestion of fraud, when you need a bankruptcy administration to protect the assets and protect the interests of creditors, then maybe only one creditor can bring the petition. Or if you've got an admission from the debtor that he's unable to pay. Now, that could be a private admission. That could be the single financial statement in which case the debtor's admitted. Those are the special circumstances that allow a single petitioner to say, 
He's not paying his debts generally as they fall due. I may be the only creditor around, but these are the circumstances that enable me to go ahead. He's told me, he's shown me this piece of paper, he's told me he can't pay. Uh, very tricky with one creditor. I've referred to the cases. If you note them up, you'll find all the tests and the guidelines. The petition has an affidavit of verification, and these are all the statutory forms, which falls at the back of the petition. It's filed with the registrar in the locality of the debtor. A debtor may have more than one locality. If it's a business that carries on, a corporation that carries on business or a partnership in several parts of the province or in several provinces, any one of them may well be the locality of the debtor. In Ontario, you file with the registrar, as you know, in Toronto, in London, and in Ottawa. Those are the three locations where you may file a petition. Eight clear days notice uh, on service of the petition before return, before the registrar. What you should do when serving the petition is you don't know, you don't know when your eight days are going to run because you don't know when the petition is going to be served. As a rule, we tell our process servers to fill in on the notice of return. We tell them to fill the date in as they're serving, add 10 days. And that gives you enough time. So if they're serving it on the 5th, they make it returnable on the 15th. The notice of return is generally endorsed on the back of the petition, on the left-hand side. Statutory language in the rules tells you what it has to say. You can put it on a separate piece of paper, but the practice and the convenience is to stick it on the back of your petition. You serve the petition and the affidavit of truth and support of it on the superintendent by registered mail. You uh, file a sealed copy of the petition with an affidavit of service with the registrar, and it says five days prior to the return date. Shouldn't be a problem there. Now you should have, if you expect not to have any defense to the petition or dispute, you should have filed as well a consent from the trustee who says he's prepared to act as trustee in this estate. Now you go, the matter's returnable before the registrar. The date you choose, 10 o'clock in the morning, you show up before the registrar. If there is no opposition filed, no dispute, the registrar will make the receiving order and provided you've got the consent of the trustee, he'll make it then and there. The rules provide that if a debtor is going to dispute the petition, it must be filed two clear days before the return date on the petition. In point of fact, if you show up at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning to dispute the petition with your dispute in your hand, the registrar will, allow, will accept that and will allow the dispute to be filed. It is a matter of courtesy, of course, if you can, to file it beforehand so the registrar knows what's going to be happening. Um, the dispute. It need not, but it can be as detailed as a pleading. Um, you have a considerable degree of latitude. The defenses in a petition uh, can be, as we often call them, the Montreal garment trade defenses. You know, I don't know who the petitioning creditor is. I never saw him before. I never ordered anything from him. If I did order it from him, he didn't ship it. If he shipped it, he didn't ship it in time. If he shipped it in time, it was the wrong color. If it was the right color, it was the wrong quality. If it was the wrong quality, it didn't conform to sample. There wasn't enough. There was too much. It just goes on and on forever. <laughs> now, you file these things, your own credibility is at stake when you go up to defend. So be very careful what you stick in. That's right, but I'm going to prove it. <laughs> um, but I mean, certainly, if you really think there's a defense, the imagination is unlimited, and especially if you've got to put the debtor to the proof of his claim. Now, the creditor to the proof of his claim. The creditor has to prove $1,000. I should warn you, it's no good to say, well, he's claimed in the petition $126,000. I only owe him 85 because the answer to that is, then pay the 85. So you've got to, if you're trying to attack the amount of the debt, you've got to be able to whittle it down. Very often you have these very convoluted cases with credits and debits and here and there, and the judge always looks at it and says, you know, bottom line, is there more than $1,000 owing? And if there's more than $1,000 that the judge is satisfied that there's owing, he issues the, makes the receiving order. So don't be too cute, there are uh, some problems. Okay, if you dispute the petition, the matter goes before the bank, it cannot be dealt with by the registrar, it goes to the bankruptcy judge, 
first time round, goes on the trial list if you're ready, and then you go up and you get adjourned and adjourned, because the problem is the bankruptcy court has dozens of cases, very few actually come to a hearing. Those that come to trial often take a lot longer than most people expect. There's only five, four or five trial days a month. Um, we've got a case that's now, it'll be two years from the filing of the petition. We're the debtor and we are only asked for one adjournment, but it'll be two years before this thing gets on for trial. And it's not because anybody's delayed. There've been a few little problems. We keep getting bumped to the bottom of a list and we never come up. If you're, in a, if you're anxious to move ahead as a petitioning creditor, you will find this a very frustrating experience. Okay, interim receivers. Um, if you're concerned about dissipation of assets, the remedies available to appoint an interim receiver, a trap for the unwary in the good old days before the debtors wised up and all the rest of it, the petitioning creditor is a matter of course filed this petition and filed an affidavit in support of the petition which said, we're concerned that if there isn't an interim receiver, all the assets will disappear out the back door, period. And they didn't say much more than that. The registrar, as a matter of course, issued an interim receiving order, which then meant the interim receiver went in, took control of the business, the receipts and the disbursements. Didn't interfere with day-to-day -day operations, but he took changed the locks he came in in the morning and opened up and he sat there watching the stuff coming in, going out, counting the cash. Tremendous burden on the debtor. And was there for a long time. Mind you, you got petitions heard a lot faster. Today, it's a problem because Mr. Justice Saunders said in a case which I lost, that you have to establish something akin to what you need for a Mareva injunction to get an interim receiver. And I think he's gone too far, but You've got to really show, not just suspicion. You have to show real grounds that there may well be an abuse. But it gets even more complicated than that because the costs of professionals are skyrocketing. How do you, you put an interim receiver in, somebody's got to pay them. And if it's a complex manufacturing operation, you've got more than one door to watch. If it's a retail chain, what do you do with the interim receiver, especially if it's a hostile petitioning creditor? Is the interim receiver going to have somebody in every one of these stores watching what's going on? It's a real problem and a burden. In many cases, we've developed, you know, you've got to be creative in this stuff. What you really want to get are the books and records to find out what the devil was going on. We have on occasion asked for and obtained an interim receiving order that allows the interim receiver to get access to books and records, copy the information, and go away. But you're frozen a picture. He goes in to take an inventory. All you want him to do is take an inventory. He gets the books and records, he checks them, and he leaves. So what you've done is say, okay, it may take us six months to resolve this dispute, but in the meantime, we can determine what the inventory is on day one, doesn't cost us very much to do that as a petitioning creditor. We don't interfere with the debtor and he carries on his business. So you think about what do you really want? You don't want to go in with a sledgehammer and a howitzer. You just want certain kinds of information. That's what you can use an interim receiver for. In getting the interim receiver, you can move at the same time you file your petition. You need your affidavit in support and your order uh, matter of practice, we're also developing the habit of uh, filing a notice of motion, although you're going without notice to the other party, and filing a record. You serve the interim receiving order, which then gives the debtor an opportunity to apply back to the registrar for an order setting aside the interim receiving order, at which point there will be affidavit evidence filed, usually affidavit evidence filed by the debtor, you then argue the thing out before the registrar. The registrar will either affirm his original order or he'll set it aside. In which case, if it's set aside, you as the petitioning creditor can appeal to the bankruptcy judge, who generally will deal with this in fairly expeditious terms. And you'll then determine whether or not the interim receiver can stay in. Um, but basically, once you, you get the order e relatively easily, if the debtor objects, you have to show cause why that order should stick. The other thing is there must be full and complete disclosure of the position of the parties in your application, in your affidavit material. Because if you don't make full and complete disclosure, the court will say you're not entitled to the relief. 
And on more than one occasion, applications have been dis um, dismissed or set aside on the application of the debtor, the receivership appointment set aside because of the creditor's failure to be really candid with the court. Okay, Frank uh, did half of the Section 20 proceedings stuff, but I'll finish off with it. You get to the creditor's meeting, and because your client has guaranteed the fees, but only to a limited extent, there is no money in the pot to fund an exercise or a vendetta against some particular party. Two things can happen. One is the creditors can kick money in to fund the exercise. What will then happen is the trustee has a pool. He'll go out and do what he has to do. The creditors will get their money back out of the, off the top. But if there's any distribution of assets, it goes under section, you know, if you recover monies, let's say if you get 100,000 back, it costs you 20 to get there. You pay the creditors back the 20, now you've got 80,000. Section 107 says, where does it go? It goes to the landlord, the employees, and Her Majesty the Queen in a whole bunch of capacities. Not attractive for the average unsecured creditor to fund the exercise that the Crown is going to take the benefit of. So there is a mechanism whereby if a creditor asks the trustee to take an action on behalf of the estate and the trustee says, no, I have no funds or I will not do it, the creditor may then bring an application before the court for an order under Section 20 directing the trustee to assign the cause of action to the creditor so that the creditor may bring that action in his own name. Now, the material, the, once you get the order, it will provide that you have to notify all the other creditors of your plan to bring the action or proceedings and give them an opportunity to participate. It works out on the basis of everybody sharing pro rata. So that if a creditor elects to participate, he says, yes, you add up all the creditors, you've got 150,000 worth of creditors, you know, you divide each, you get a pro rata share by dividing the claims, and that's what everybody kicks in. You every so often get a rather perverse situation where one of the unsecured creditors, perhaps for a very substantial amount, has also received a preference or has been party to a reviewable transaction. One creditor moves. The party who got the reviewable transaction of his benefit that's being challenged also has an unsecured claim. He's entitled to participate in the proceeding against himself. Why would he do so? Well, if his claim is big enough in dollars relative to all the others who participate, He's got an insurance policy because by picking up, say, 50% of the costs of attacking himself, if the attack is successful, he'll get 50% of the proceeds. Now, you may think this is perverse. I've done it on one occasion. I've seen it happen on two. You've seen it happen, I'm sure. <laughs> there was a court decision that actually said you can do this. Uh, it upsets people. Okay, fraudulent preferences, um, very uh, series of complex, uh, well, not so complex, but a lengthy definition that's got lots of pieces that fit together under section 73. Bear in mind that a creditor is defined to include a guarantor or a surety for a debt due to a creditor. So for example, if an individual has guaranteed the bank loan and the company goes bankrupt, the guarantor is a creditor just as the bank is. And if provision has been made to pay the bank off early so as to protect the guarantor, it's both the guarantor and the bank that are subject to attack for a preference. I won't go through all the time limits and everything else, but dealing with the, but the important thing is the presumption. If you fall within the three month or the 12 month period, if you have related parties, you then say, if the transaction had the effect of preferring the creditor. If, in other words, if it looks like he got a better deal than everybody else, then it's presumed to have been made, the payment of the transaction, with the intention of the debtor to prefer the creditor. At that point, the burden of proof is on the creditor who got the preference to establish that the debtor did not intend to prefer him. So. The trustee has to establish that at the time the payment of the transfer, whatever happened, 
the bankrupt was insolvent. That is sometimes more difficult to do than you might think because you have to go back and try and reconstruct uh, books and records. Uh, insolvency doesn't usually strike overnight, but it's sometimes hard to pinpoint the exact date. They've got to prove the time frame. The payment was within three months or 12 months if you're a related person. Three months, you don't have a lot of problem proving insolvency. 12 months, you may have a lot of problems proving it, just to caution. And then you have to show as a trustee that the payment or the transfer had the effect of preferring the creditor. It is said strictly that the intention of the creditor is not relevant. It's the intention of the debtor that counts. That's not entirely accurate because the intention of the creditor can often shed some light on what the debtor intended to do. The creditor's intention is to get paid but he may have exerted some measure of pressure or he may have said something to the debtor, which indicates the debtor really did intend to give him a better piece than everybody else. To rebut the presumption, you've got three months, you've got the effect of preferring, you have to show as the challenge party that you got the payments in the ordinary course. The payment had been made when due and all the other payments you got were made when due. Um, the payment was made to you, sure you knew the debtor was in difficulty, but you were the only supplier of a product that the debtor needed. The payment was made to protect a source of supply. There could be an allegation of a pre-existing agreement. There could be security for advances, both fresh and old. And in those cases, you can sever the transaction. You may have a series of things where you've got advances, security taken, past advances may be, security for past advances may be preferential. <laughs> but any security taken for fresh advances will stand. You can sever. Now, I see that some people took me literally and got up and walked out, and I see that my time is up. So I'm not going to go on at length. Um, however, I'm going to touch. OK. All right, Frank said I should ask for some questions. Are there any questions? Otherwise, I may tie you up for a couple more minutes. No questions. Bear in mind, one thing about fraudulent preferences, is because when you're sitting in the shoes of the creditor who got paid, and I'll, I'll get back to you in a second, you may get a letter from a trustee that says, your client got payment within three months of bankruptcy, therefore it's a preference. They're just throwing out the net to see what they're going to pick up. Go back to your client and ask him the facts of the payment, because you, and a lot of times this picks up money. But you may find out that it was an ordinary course payment. There's a rational explanation. Write the letter back to the trustee. Very often, the trustee will disappear and go away because he knows the creditor's serious about a defense. That was my one warning on preferences. Yes, sir? Where it is obvious, or it appears obvious to yourself that as a trustee, that there has been a fraudulent payment to one or two creditors. But beyond the three months, but at a time when you can get information, you have sufficient information to establish the debtor was insolvent at that time, and you get an affidavit to that effect, could you extend beyond the three months? Of no, that not a, if you're talking about a fraudulent preference, which is a payment to a creditor, to a you're, to a group, you're really stuck with the three-month period. However, there is the Assignments and Preferences Act of the province of Ontario, which you can resort to and is valid legislation and covers payments outside of the three month period. However, there are a couple of problems. In that, under that statute, you have to prove both intention of the debtor and the creditor. You have to prove concurrent intention. And if I remember correctly, Frank, a payment of money in ex is not caught by the Assignments and Preferences Act. So you have to show some other kind of a transaction. In other words, it's a piece of legislation that is very difficult to use and very rarely resorted to. Now, if you've got a fraudulent conveyance, but that's, not, that's to a stranger, not to a creditor, of course, you have no time limits. Yes? Um, well, prima facie, I think you got them. But then you go back and find out that they'd been negotiating this thing for a year and a half, and there's a whole, there'd been an arrangement that this was to have been done. And then I don't know the answer, but I think it gets more difficult. Bill? Are you 
<laughs> there's a string of definitions in the Bankruptcy Act. Inclu there's a number of tests, and there's common law tests. No, no, there's also a definition of insolvency. But, they fine? They fine? Yeah, it's a question. One, there's the liabilities exceed your assets on a balance sheet test. There's the failure to be able to meet your obligations that come along. And then there's value of assets if sold on a distressed basis wouldn't equal. Now, there's, you read the statutory test in the Bankruptcy Act. There's a common law test that's slightly different. They all are more or less the same. But the trick is, if you're going back a year, how do you prove what was happening at that point of time? If you're doing it from the books and records, the odds are that the bankrupt didn't have much in the way of books and records. That's one of the causes of bankruptcy. He didn't know where he was. So you do have a problem. Sometimes it's obvious. You know, uh, most commercial bankruptcies in the three-month time frame, you don't have a lot of problem. I remember one years ago we were involved in where there was a very substantial payment to a wife. It was just within the one-year period, and we couldn't prove insolvency at that point of time. There, just, there wasn't enough evidence to hang it out. Was there another question? Okay, when your client has a fraudulent preference action commenced, and he got $50,000 in payments, don't despair. Even if you figure inside deep in your heart that it was a preference, don't despair, because there's a lot that slips between you know, the issuing of the statement of claim and getting to the courthouse door and out after the judgment. And a very well-known and famous practitioner in this town once told me, Gordon, he said, I'm always prepared to settle a preference claim for 50 cents on the dollar. Well, I now know that instead of losing 50 if you settle expeditiously, <clears throat> 25 cents may not be bad. With Frank, I settled one, what, at 75 cents last year. But whatever it is, there's always room to, you know, all is not lost. Your client will not suffer a complete uh, loss of the funds unless he's determined to fight the thing out all the way down to the wire. Because most trustees and inspectors are very practical business people. They, you can't make any money in court. It costs you almost as much to recover the money as what you're going to get anyhow. So most of them will, did, Carol, I'm not giving away trade secrets, am I? No, most of them will discount just to get the money in and get the thing over with. So that gives your client some leverage. The other side, of course, is when the client says to you, I know the debtor's in trouble. He wants to pay me. What happens if it's a preference? I say, what happens if it's not? I mean, you know, better to have loved than lost than never to have loved at all. At least you got a fighting chance and you got the money. Anyhow, I promised I wouldn't keep you very long. I've kept you longer than I promised. If you have no more questions, thank you very much. That concludes our uh, program today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you had the whole bar admission course in one day, and of course we've covered a great deal of material from basic collection all the way through to bankruptcy and taking legal proceedings within the bankruptcy estate. Now you can uh, sympathize with the bar ad students that go through with this. This also happens to be the last of 12 mandatory courses. So by the end of February, they've had it. And it's a great deal of material to uh, absorb in an immersion course and then go back into their seminar groups and discuss a case study. And then, of course, now I ask you questions to see how much you've learned through the day. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I appreciate if you would fill out the evaluation forms to tell the Department of Education what you thought of the program and the speakers, the materials, and everything else that they will have some form of guideline for the future. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>